Chapter 2 Are Transsexuals Born or Made? Or Both? The causes of transsexualism have been debated for years. Perhaps the earliest commentator was Herodotus. He explained the origin of what he referred to as the Scythian illness by resorting to divine causation. Venus, enraged with the plundering of her temple at Aeschylus, changed the Scythian males and their posterity into women as her divine punishment for their misdeeds. Herodotus notwithstanding, most theories fall into two camps, biological and psychological. Biological theories have tended to focus on neuroendocrine factors. In this chapter, I will mainly be concerned with these biological aspects, especially as they are developed as part of an interactionist theory in the writings of John Money and his associates. Chapter 3 will be devoted to psychological theories of transsexualism, which highlight factors of imprinting, family conditioning, and general psychoanalytic hypotheses. In both chapters, I will demonstrate that while biological and psychological investigations seek different causes, they both utilize the same theoretical model, i.e. both seek causes within the individual and or interpersonal matrix. In such investigations, social, political, and cultural processes tend to be relegated to a subsidiary or non-existent role because the model focuses attention on individual or interpersonal gender differences and similarities rather than upon the gender-defined social system in which transsexual behaviors arise. For example, Psychological theories measure a transsexual's adjustment or non-adjustment to the cultural identity and role of masculinity or femininity. They seldom question the social norms of masculinity and femininity themselves. The chapter will be concerned mainly with the work of John Money and Associates. There are many reasons I have chosen to do an extensive analysis of Money's work. First, his theories on sex differences have gained wide acceptance, both in academic and lay circles. They have also been widely cited by feminist scholars. No other researcher in this area has developed any comparable body of research. Thus, most discussions of sex differences refer to Money's work as a kind of Bible. Second, no one has done a comprehensive analysis and critique of Money's work especially as it relates to issues surrounding transsexualism. For example, Money's much-publicized theory that core gender identity is fixed by the age of 18 months forms one critical basis for the justification of transsexual surgery and therefore deserves special attention. Finally, inherent in Money's proclaimed scientific statements about sex differences or many normative and philosophical statements about the natures of women and men. Under the guise of science, he makes normative and prescriptive statements about who women and men are and who they ought to be. It is one task of this chapter to expose these assertions. Money's theories about sex differences are based on the supposition that the nature-nurture debate is obsolete. Instead, he proposes an interactionist theory of sex differences that claims to unite biological and environmental factors in it to a unique, sophisticated gestalt. At times he sounds like a biologizer and at other times like an environmental determinist. It is very difficult to get a precise grasp on exactly what money is stating. Thus, while it may seem that I am equivocating with the explanations and critique of Money's theories, this is because Money himself consistently equivocates. In discussing the importance of biology, Money is no biologizer of the Antian regime in which, for example, hormonal determinists linked anatomy directly with destiny. I am reminded here of theories about female behavior that were based on raging hormonal imbalances, 
or male bonding theories based on reductionist endocrinology and selective anthropology. Rather, what makes Money's theories on sex differences so attractive to those who should know better is that he claims to unite biological and environmental factors into a unique, sophisticated whole. On the environmental side, Money's statements about the effects of socialization or learning are just as deceiving. Possibly to avoid the charge of biologizer, Money emphasizes that the socialization side of the coin is more significant than the biological. In fact, it is so significant that core gender identity is fixed during the first 18 months of life. Here the theme changes from biology is destiny to socialization is destiny. Yet many of those who accept money's theory seem not to notice this switch, which takes on all the force of a new natural law. The seductiveness of money's work resides in the fact that he comes close to the truth in postulating that the interaction of biology and environment may explain certain facets of sex differences. But it is my contention that he has failed to show us that they do. Thus, he tells us very little about the origins of transsexualism. The nature-nurture debate is obsolete. In my opinion, there are five main aspects to money's theory of sex differences. The distinction between nature and nurture, or innate traits versus acquired traits, is obsolete. Biology combined with socialization determines sex differences. Two, a most critical period in the development of sex differences is the prenatal stage. At this point, hormones activate the brain and set the direction, but not the extent, of sex differences. Three, the development of gender identity can be compared to the development of native language. Four, the locking tight of gender identity occurs by the age of 18 months. After this, it is very difficult, if not impossible, to reverse psychosexual orientation. Five, social change will come about not by doing away with cultural definitions of masculinity and femininity, but by bringing more flexibility to the stereotypes to meet present and future changes. Money dissociates himself from early theorists of biological determinism by accusing them of using simplistic methods. He purports to take a more solidly scientific approach using new information. One way in which he has been able to escape the label of simplistic biologizing is by what I have termed his pseudo-interactionism or pseudo-organicism. Compared to early theorists, Money appears to be a very astute and careful researcher of gender identity. For example, the earlier, more reductionist theorists linked anatomy directly to destiny. Straightforward links between hormonal factors and supposed behavioral results were simplistically set forth. In money, however, the connection between the two is indirect. There is a mediating structure, the human brain, more specifically the hypothalamus, which when activated by specific sex hormones, sets up a neural pathways for gender identity that postnatal socialization later develops. As early as 1963, Money was saying that the dichotomy between innate and acquired traits was conceptually outdated. This assertion has continued to form the philosophical underpinning for all of his work on sex differences and is reiterated as the basis of man and woman, boy and girl. In the theory of psychosexual differentiation, it is now outmoded to juxtapose nature versus nurture, the genetic versus the environment, the innate versus the acquired, the biological versus the psychological, or the instinctive versus the learned. Modern genetic theory avoids these antiquated dichotomies and postulates a genetic norm of reaction which, for its proper expression, requires philetically prescribed environmental boundaries. If these boundaries are either too constricted or too diffuse, 
then the environment is lethal and the genetic code cannot express itself for the cells carrying it are non-viable. The interaction of biological and social factors is explained by using the concept of a program and by comparing that program to the development of native language. There are certain parts of the program that exert determining influence, particularly in the prenatal period, and leave a permanent imprint. These are hormonal influences that act on the brain to set up a supposed neural pathways to receive postnatal, social, gender identity signals. After birth, the biological program shifts to one of psychosexual conditioning, and the gender identity now becomes largely a matter of biographical history, especially social biography. Once written, the social biography program leaves its imprint, as did the biological. Money and Earhart admit that of the two, the social factors are the most influential part of gender identity differentiation, but that prenatal hormonal factors are necessary to set the direction, if not the extent of sex differences. They predispose. Such theories have an attraction because they seemingly reconcile opposing factors. They achieve instant reconciliation, so to speak. However, it is important to examine organic theories, especially those that claim to have a scientific base, to see if the connection is made by fiat rather than by demonstrable and credible evidence. I believe that there is a series of missing links in money's approach. For example, let us examine the biological program. Money and Earhart assertions about the importance of prenatal hormonal factors influencing behavior rest on statements such as the following. Testicular secretions, their presence or absence, or their intrusion from exogenous sources, account not only for the shape of the external, but also for certain patterns of organization in the brain, especially by inference in the hypothalamus, pathways that will subsequently influence certain aspects of sexual behavior. Thus, they pass on the program, dividing it between two carriers, namely the genital morphology and that part of the central nervous system, peripheral and intracranial, which serves as the genital morphology. Put simply, if a person for some reason has more androgen prenatally, it will take less stimulus to orient that person towards strenuous physical activity, certain designated masculine activities, and more stimulus to evoke a response to helpless children and other designated feminine activities. To prove this, money draws on data from animal experimentation and from certain groups of females who were androgenized in utero. There is something missing, however. How do hormonal secretions account not only for physical genital formation, but for certain patterns of organization in the brain, which influence certain aspects of sexual behavior? The connection between hormonal determinants and subsequent brain patterns is never made clear. How does the central nervous system, insofar as prenatal hormonal factors make it sexually dimorphic, pass on its program in the form of behavioral traits, which are culturally classified as predominantly boyish or girlish? Money and Earhart are cautious enough to say, these traits do not automatically determine the dimorphism of gender identity, but they exert some influence on the ultimate pattern of gender identity. This is precisely the question, however. How do they exert even some influence? And what is the content of this specific influence? Money admits that the precise answer to this question is not yet known. Quote, in human beings, the pathways have not yet been anatomically identified. Unquote. If this is money and Earhart's ultimate conclusion, then it is reasonable to ask why they spent so many pages discussing probability at best 
of especially the animal findings being extrapolated to human behavior. Money and Earhart appear to be forcing the parallel between animal behavior and females androgenized in utero. It is just as credible that the so-called masculine behavior of the androgenized girls could be entirely due to postnatal socialization. In summary, the point is, should any significance be claimed for biological factors in the development of gender identity, just because Money and Earhart proclaim that the nature-nurture debate is outmoded and that there is an organic interaction between biology and socialization should not dissuade us from asking for the specific evidence in a work that makes great pretensions to using scientific modes of inquiry. Is science and John Money reducible to hidden pseudo-metaphysical statements about the nature and behavior of men and women? Or, as Anne Oakley has pointed out, why do these alleged prenatal hormonal factors that set the course for gender identity differentiation so exactly parallel the course that society sets for masculine and feminine gender identity and role? Is what is at stake in money's work not science, but a worldview, ideology, or faith commitment of an ontological sort? It appears that money has only negated the idea that it is either or, but has not proven the reality that it is both and. Hormonal Happenings in the Womb According to money, in the case of transsexualism, possibly something goes wrong during the prenatal critical period. Specifically, Money and Earhart list a number of prenatal abnormal determinants, not all of which necessarily influence the development of transsexualism. The phyletic program may be altered by idiosyncrasies of personal history, such as the loss or gain of a chromosome during cell division, a deficiency or excess of maternal hormones, viral invasion, intrauterine trauma, nutritional deficiency or toxicity, and so forth. Other idiosyncratic modifications may be added by the biographical events of birth. Unquote. Of all such idiosyncratic modifications, however, Money and Earhart devote themselves most explicitly to hormonal factors. They are careful to assert, nevertheless, that these hormonal factors and how they relate to transsexualism are imperfectly understood. Quote, there may well be an as yet undiscovered fetal metabolic or hormonal component which acts to induce a predisposition to ambiguity or incongruity of postnatal gender identity differentiation. There may be a special disposition in the organization of the brain toward the acquisition of roles and their dissociation in the manner of multiple personality or fugue state. In either case, a prenatal disposition is probably insufficient in itself and needs to be augmented by postnatal social history. End quote. Thus, the authors are careful to appeal again to their interactionist theory of sex differences, being cautious about overstressing the hormonal. The Overriding Effects of Androgen According to Money, male and female hormones are not equally significant in affecting the hypothalamic pathways that will subsequently influence certain aspects of sexual behavior. Rather, it is the presence or absence of androgen that is most determinative. Until about the sixth week after conception, the embryo does not begin to differentiate sexually, or as some would phrase it, all human fetuses are female up to this point. Biological femaleness results from the absence of androgenic hormones. Money and Earhart stated this way, quote, In the particular context of neonatal or prenatal hormonal effects, the antithesis of androgen is not estrogen, but nothing, end quote. 
In Money's opinion, androgen regulates both the development of external genitalia and certain forms of behavior and intelligence. As far as the external organs are concerned, quote, feminine differentiation requires only the absence of androgen. It does not require the presence of a feminizing substance, end quote. Likewise, the presence or absence of androgen affects behavior. Here again, quote, the antithesis of androgen is not estrogen, but no gonadal hormone at all. In fact, no substitute whatever, end quote. The absence of androgen either at the prenatal critical period or at other critical periods of development, whether absent normally, as in the genetic female, or artificially through castration or anti-androgen treatment in the genetic male, results in a brain organized to produce so-called feminine behavior and response. Thus, it is money in Earhart's contention that there is a fetal organization of neural structures, essentially of the hypothalamus, which makes parts of the brain essentially male or female. Portions of the fetal brain affect not only hormonal and reproductive functions, but also behavior, especially lovemaking and coitus. However, other behavior patterns are affected as well. For example, Money and Earhart cite so-called tomboy conduct. Their causal explanation of tomboyism is grounded in fetal hormonal activity. Quote, the most likely hypothesis to explain the various features of tomboyism in fetally masculinized genetic females is that their tomboyism is a sequel to a masculinizing effect on the fetal brain. This masculinization may apply specifically to pathways most probably in the limbic system or paleocortex that mediate dominance assertion, possibly in association with assertion of exploratory and territorial rights, and therefore manifests itself in competitive energy expenditure, end quote. Originally, the authors also made a positive correlation, although tenuously, between increased fetal androgen and increased IQ. Money and Earhart stated that there is, quote, some preliminary evidence to suggest that an abnormally elevated prenatal androgen level, whether in genetic males or females, enhances IQ, end quote. The authors claim that this finding of IQ elevation in females exposed to excessive androgen was not a finding that was looked for. It was a serendipitous one, and one that also occurred in genetic males similarly exposed. Footnote. Earhart has subsequently discredited the IQ findings herself. In conjunction with Susan Baker, she has stated that it is highly unlikely that increase in IQ is an effect of hormone treatment. Rather, it is a construct of inadequately matched controls. Footnote. In order to prove that androgen affects the kinds of behavior referred to above, Money and Brennan cite studies with two human control groups who were accidentally androgenized in utero. The first was done on a group of girls with the so-called Andrenogenital syndrome. The second study researched another group of girls with progestin induced syndrome. These syndromes are explained further in the following pages. Money and Brennan connect both syndromes with transsexualism. Basically, their words speak for themselves. Quote, Tomboyishness in the progestin induced and the adrenogenital syndromes is a matter chiefly of physical energy expenditure and outdoor athletic interest of the type customarily assigned to boys. This description of tomboyishness in childhood applies fairly well to what the transsexual patients reported of themselves, except that they grew up to discover they were lesbian-oriented in their erotic disposition. One may, therefore, legitimately pose the question of whether a tendency to tomboyish energy expenditure 
is not a primary trait in incipient female transsexuals and one that somehow facilitates the subsequent differentiation of a transsexual gender identity provided various prerequisite postnatal conditions are encountered, end quote. Always careful, however, never to stress the biological side of the coin alone, Money and Earhart explain transsexual development further by reverting to their interactionist approach. Quote, These traits may interact with postnatal social influences that shape gender identity. Prenatally induced tomboyish traits, for example, may make it easy for a genetic female to have not simply a tomboyish version of a feminine gender identity, but if postnatal circumstances also conspire to differentiate a transsexual gender identity and want a sex reassignment. The same might happen in reverse for a genetic male, end quote. One may legitimately ask, however, how many female to constructed male transsexuals have either the progestin-induced or the adrenogenital syndromes, and how many tomboys become transsexuals? Anticipating these questions and others like them, Money and Brennan admit that, after all is said and done, quote, the most economical conclusion to draw from all the foregoing is that female transsexualism is a disorder of psychosexual differentiation and is, regardless of a still unknown etiology, a psychological manifestation, end quote. Monkey see, mammals do. Much of Money's theorizing concerning hormonal activity in utero, specifically with respect to androgen, is based on animal experimentation. Rats, hamsters, and monkeys in particular, who were androgenized prenatally or neonatally, were studied under mating conditions. Citing the so-called masculine behavior of the prenatally androgenized hermaphroditic female rhesus monkey, Money and Earhart state that her activities are reminiscent of tomboyism in girls. Like male monkeys, she shows an increased amount of play initiation, rough and tumble activity, chasing behavior, and playful threats. It is important here to note that tomboyism is never specifically defined by Money, but always described in this kind of behavior. Mounting play is increased compared to other female monkeys who present hide-in stances of sexual invitation. Moreover, the patterns of mounting of such masculinized monkeys also take on a masculine stance. All of this is by way of demonstrating that the human clinical syndromes concerning the influence of prenatal hormones on gender behavior that are reviewed in man and woman, boy and girl, have their counterparts in experimental animal data. The authors caution, however, that these prenatal hormones only set the direction which later interaction with the social environment completes. They also caution that in the final analysis, quote, little can be said regarding the various structures of the brain that supposedly are subject to prenatal hormonal organizing influences. End quote. A two-way critique. On a scientific level, several commentators have made major criticisms of gender identity and behavior theories that rely on animal findings, with particular reference to Money's work. Anne Oakley, for one, has stressed that animal research can only be applied hypothetically to humans, particularly in the field of sexual behavior. She has noted that animals are subject to a much more direct control mechanism than humans. Humans impose an additional control of learning. Oakley cites Rose's work, which reached the conclusion that although androgen may be significantly related to sexual behavior, the social context of the monkeys themselves is of great importance. For example, female rhesus monkeys injected with androgen show an increase in the male practice of mounting, but only if they are dominant members of their group to begin with before they are injected. If subordinate females are injected, 
the incidence of mounting behavior remains the same. Likewise, when dominant male monkeys who secrete testosterone in excess are placed in a social environment where their dominance is not recognized, they become inferior members of the group and their testosterone output lessens considerably. Thus, it can be seen that the role of sex hormones in generating signals that are relayed to the brain and converted into sexual arousal is clearly outweighed by environmental factors. In the latter example of the male monkeys, to reverse the Freudian adage, it is destiny that determines anatomy, or at least determines hormone levels. The testosterone output itself varied enormously depending on how the male monkey perceived his environment and his place in it. Further research has shown how aggressive behavior in animals is significantly dependent on how it is reinforced. Mice and dogs can be trained to relative passivity by altering the type of reinforcement that aggressive behavior is usually activated by. But in the animal world, study of the way in which environmental factors may be able to affect behavior has been neglected. Elizabeth Atkins has pointed to a number of factors in the animal experiments that make human comparisons or extrapolations from animal data highly dubious. She reinforces the role of environment and its impact on rhesus monkeys. Researchers have found that there are discrepancies between those animals reared in the laboratory and those reared in the wild. The latter are less aggressive and thus Atkins suggests that some of the sex differences in early hormone effects may have been influenced by the artificial social and physical environment of the monkeys. Furthermore, the majority of the animal experiments use copulating behavior as an example of sex differences. None of the human experiments do. Quote, the primary effect of early exposure to androgen in the female rat is that the capacity to display low doses, the receptive posture, is impaired. Yet there is no human behavior homologous to lordosis. And in fact, human female sexual behavior is not particularly controlled by sex hormones at all. End quote. It is also difficult to sex type animal behavior from one species to another since there is marked species differentiation. Atkins cites Kleiman's findings, which showed that in some mammals, Males are more aggressive than females, and others, females are more aggressive. Thus, it is very difficult to generalize anything about animal behavior, whether within a species or cross species. The analogies to human behavior are all the more difficult to make. What do such findings ultimately indicate about the pertinence of animal behavior in assessing human behavior? Humans, to an even greater degree, impose additional controls on any hormonal experiments that of sociocultural factors in general. And it is the human ability to learn and to rationalize, or even to be affected by sociocultural factors that are not necessarily learned, that make generalizations from other species difficult and of dubious value. Quote, the analogy becomes increasingly ridiculous when we add that the non-human female primate has no hymen, menopause, or artificial feeding bottle. The male of these species are dominant, aggressive, and show no desire and ability to give the female pleasure. This is equally absurd in its application to human culture, enabling the patriarchal world to be supported in its very foundation, justifying the aggressive acts of the male in the bedroom by reference to the jungle and providing a rationale for aggressive acts in the distinctly human world of social, economic, and political affairs, end quote. We might also add here that it is absurd to extrapolate human data from animal activity in the jungle. It is also absurd to extrapolate such data from animals in cages. The only human context where the effects of outside androgen increase in females could be studied were the progestin-induced syndrome and the adrenogenital syndrome. Money and Earhart studied both groups. In the first case, 10 girls had been 
androgenized accidentally in utero as a result of the drug progestin, which their mothers took during pregnancy. In the adrenal genital syndrome, the adrenal cortex in the normal XX female fails to synthesize cortisone and instead releases an incomplete product that has the biological masculinizing properties of androgen. Money and Earhart study a group of 15 girls with this syndrome whose androgen level was reduced gradually after birth. They ranged in age from 4 to 16 years old. In both groups, the progestin-induced and the adrenal genital, each girl's androgen excess leveled off postnatally. They developed a normal-looking female genitalia and appearance, and they were raised as females. However, Money and Earhart found, in contrast to a control group of females who had not been excessively androgenized in utero, that they showed the so-called opposite sex behavior, e.g. tomboyism, rough and tumble play. Elizabeth Atkins has asked, however, if this is the only interpretation that can be made. Upon closer examination, she finds many problems with the method and design used by the experimenters. First of all, the adrenal genital girls had been treated with cortisone since infancy, which itself can have behavioral effects that would differentiate these girls from others. Adrenal genital girls who were not receiving cortisone were never tested. More importantly, parental treatment may have produced less sex-typed behavior, since such parents may have been more willing to tolerate tomboyish actions because they knew their girls were different. Most significantly, Atkins states that what then was looked upon as deviant girlish behavior is now the norm. Finally, observers have pointed out that human hormone levels as well as animal hormone levels vary according to environmental circumstances. For example, many forms of stress have been correlated with a drop in testosterone. Quote, Moreover, hormone levels in a given individual vary according to environmental circumstances. A study of American soldiers in Vietnam, for example, showed a sharp drop in testosterone levels. We were apparently dealing with a fluctuating process, not a fixed state, end quote. Aside from the critical commentary that has already been directed at Money's work on sex differences from a scientific level, there is a more philosophical critique that can be made at this point. Money and Earhart's statements about the overriding effects of androgen have strong suggestions of Aristotelian slash Domestic biology. In Aristotle and Thomas, the male principle was seen to be the active power of generation, and the female principle the passive power, or worse, the totally non affecting power, read non power or even non being. According to Thomas Aquinas, quote, Among perfect animals, the active power of generation belongs to the male sex and the passive power to the female. As regards to the individual nature, woman is defective and misbegotten, for the active force in the male seed tends to the production of a perfect likeness in the masculine sex, while the production of woman comes from defect in the active force, or from some material indisposition, or even from some external influence, such as that of a south wind which is moist, as the philosopher observes." End quote. Money and Earhart say much the same thing in the language they choose to describe the power of androgens. Quote, the antithesis of androgen is not estrogen, but nothing. End quote. In Money's theories of sex differences, androgen is the activating principle. Quote, feminine differentiation requires only the absence of androgen. It does not require the presence of a feminizing substance. End quote. However, not only estrogen or the other female hormones such as progesterone that are said to be passively present. What remains obscured in Money and Earhart's work is the initial female development of all embryos. Money's overriding effects of androgen statements can be thrown into bolder relief by contrasting his words with those of endocrinologist Estelle Ramey, 
who phrases the androgen principle in this way, quote, For the little it is worth as commentary on Adam's rib, it is the female sex that is primal. The early embryo is female until the fifth or sixth week of fetal life. A testicular inductor substance must be generated at this point to suppress the growth of ovaries. No ovarian inductor is required for female differentiation because all mammalian embryos of either genetic sex have the innate capacity for femaleness. Eve, and not Adam, appears to have been the primeval human that God had in mind. End quote. This wording projects quite a different picture than Money and Earhart's assertion about the insignificance of estrogen. Indeed, Ramey presents the initial female momentum of sex differentiation as being so powerful that it must be suppressed. Warren Gadpale, MD, states the same principle in this way, quote, Nature's prime disposition is to produce females. Maleness only results from something added, androgen. In the absence of androgens, whether the fetus is of XX or XY genotype, differentiation will proceed as female. Though in the genotype XY in mammalian species at least, ovaries will not differentiate. The converse is not true. The absence of ovaries, and thus of estrogenic and progestinic substances, does not interfere with female internal and external sex structure development, though such individuals will naturally be infertile. End quote. Thus, initial embryonic female differentiation is so powerful that even without the presence of female hormones, female internal and external sex structure will result, whether in an XX or XY genotype. Furthermore, as Eileen Van Tassel has pointed out, the male needs the X chromosome in order to survive. There is no Y O chromosomal anomaly. The female, however, does not need a second X, and XO females have been born and survived. Both Ramey and Gadpale's statements suggest that, in opposition to Money and Earhart's interpretations, it would be more correct to say that genetic XXness is the primordially activating substance. As Robert Stoller has said, quote, the genital anatomic fact is that, embryologically speaking, the penis is a masculinized clitoris. The neurophysiological fact is that the male brain is an androgenized female brain, end quote. Why is it then that Money and his associates have not pointed out that it is essentially a female anatomy and a female brain that sets the course of biological development that male hormones only turn in a different direction. If there is a biological basis or force for masculine and feminine behavior, as money asserts, which sets the direction but not the extent of sexual behavior and psychosexual differentiation, then this biological force may be initially female. Or, more importantly, why pick an arbitrary period of androgen onset and speculate that this is the critical period when the equally critical period might be the original fetal female state? In the book Sexual Signatures, Money has taken note of what he and Patricia Tucker call the Eve base view. It is significant that this interpretation appears in Money's more popularized work on sex differences and not in man and woman, boy and girl. Quote, when it comes to male and female, the Bible tells of Adam as the base with something, a rib taken away to make Eve. In the light of modern research, you might take Eve as the base and think of something, male hormone added to make Adam, or you could keep Adam as the base with something, again, male hormone decreased to make Eve. We have adopted the Eve base view and will refer to the something that must be added for male differentiation as the Adam principle, end quote. It is certainly not evident throughout man and woman, boy and girl, that Money and Earhart have adopted the Eve base view. Nor does Money follow through on the 
statement in view of his belief about the overriding effects of androgen. Money's use of masculine, feminine, tomboy, sissy is revealing. The language of masculinization and feminization is applied equally to biologizing processes and psychosocial processes. The explanation of tomboyism stands out here very strikingly. For example, Money states, quote, The most likely hypothesis to explain the various features of tomboyism in fetally masculinized genetic females is that tomboyism is a sequel to a masculinizing effect on the fetal brain, end quote. In several places, Money talks about genetic males and females failing to develop normal masculine or feminine gender identities. Obviously, Money and his associates accept the stereotypes to some extent. To consistently term assertive and rough-and-tumble behavior on the part of girls tomboyish, and to persist in naming certain behavioral qualities as masculine or feminine, is to support patriarchal history's assertion that such behavior and qualities are and should be sex-specific. Here, the language of inadequate science becomes subtly transferred to the language of ethics. While it is true that many cultures define certain behaviors, personality characteristics, tasks, and activities as male or female, masculine or feminine, a point that Money and Associates highlight, these same cultures define masculinity and femininity in vastly different ways, emphasizing various qualities, interests, and occupations as sex-linked. Anthropologists such as Mead, Malinowski, and Devereaux have written extensively on the subject. It appears that the language of masculinity and femininity varies so widely throughout the world that the only reason for maintaining it seems to be an implicit belief that societies must link some behaviors and qualities to the biological sex in order to be orderly and functional. This, as will be developed later, is money's contention within suitable boundaries of flexibility. Gender identity development compared to development of native language. A third main point in Money's theory of sex differences is an analogy with language. Money and Tucker remark that it is no accident that the years of language development, the first few years after birth, are also the years of gender identity formation. Quote, you were born wired for language, so to speak, but not programmed for any particular language. The environmental trigger that enabled you to start talking was the use of language by those around you during that critical language learning period, the first few years after birth. It was the interaction between your prenatally programmed disposition for language and the postnatal socially programmed language signals you heard that made it possible. You couldn't have become a talking person unless somebody talked a language to you. Furthermore, the language that was talked to you then put its mark on the way you could think ever after. It becomes your native language and will always be your native language, even if you never use it afterward, end quote. In the same way, Money and Talker talk about the development of gender identity. Supposedly, persons are born with, quote, something that was ready to become your gender identity. You were wired but not programmed for gender in the same sense that you were wired but not programmed for language, end quote. The analogy between development of native language and formation of gender identity is flawed. First of all, money confuses a general ability to speak any language, depending upon cultural factors, with a specific ability to differentiate according to one gender identity, i.e. either the so-called masculine or feminine gender. According to money, as we have seen, gender identity is predisposed by prenatal, rather specific, hormonal factors and later added to by postnatal environmental influences. It is quite a different thing to say that one is wired for language, and that one is wired for gender. 
While we are not wired for any particular language, as money readily admits, we are hormonally wired for a specific gender identity within flexible limits of the stereotype, if all goes well. A more suitable analogy would be that we are wired to exercise a variety of behavioral qualities in the same way that we are wired to speak a variety of languages, both very dependent on postnatal learning and cultural factors. If money simply said that we are wired to develop some sexual identity, i.e. some awareness of ourselves as sexual beings, then there would be no argument with them. It is ironic that money should choose the analogy of native language when, in other instances, he has remained so insensitive to his own syntactic exploitation. The locking tight of gender identity. If biology begins the program of gender identity, social factors set the direction of that behavior in an even more determined way. In Money's work, the gender assignment in rearing transcends all other determinants. He cites instances of children with identical genotypes, hormones, gonads, and other internal structures, some of whom were reared as girls and others as boys. In almost every instance, the child came to regard her or himself as female or male, depending on the way in which she or he was reared. The gender of rearing remained, even in the face of contradictory pubertal changes. Most dramatic of all are cases in which even the external genitalia were obviously more similar to the opposite sex than the child was assigned to and in which she or he was reared. Even in these cases, gender identity remained unequivocally that of assignment and rearing. Money is very specific about the critical period for gender identity, that is, between the ages of 12 and 18 months, asserting that gender identity is pretty well fixed by the age of 18 months. In the case of hermaphrodites, quote, it is ill-advised to impose a sex reassignment on a child in contradiction of a gender identity already well advanced in its differentiation, which means that the age ceiling for imposed reassignment is, in the majority of cases, around 18 months, end quote. This is so because child rearing in a culture is sexually distinctive, and from the day that an infant is picked up out of a crib, that child begins to get gender identity signals by the way she or he is touched, spoken to, etc. Quote, The minute you were born, society took over. When the drama of your birth reached its climax, you were promptly greeted with the glad ritual cry, it's a boy or it's a girl, depending on whether or not those in attendance observe the penis in your crotch. The label boy or girl, however, has tremendous force as a self-fulfilling prophecy, for it throws the full weight of society to one side or the other as the newborn heads for the gender identity fork. Parents react differently to the signal son or daughter from the first moment, end quote. There are some exceptions, of course, to this age ceiling, but this is due to confused gender-rearing practices. For example, when parents are given conflicting diagnoses of their infant's sex, perhaps by different physicians at different times, they may express their uncertainty in confused gender-rearing practices. But on the whole... In the normal, read culturally prescribed, process of gender identity and role development, the locking tight of this process occurs at an incredibly early age. Furthermore, according to Money, once girls are defined by the absence of a penis, not by the presence of female genitalia. This corresponds to his theory of prenatal development, where it is the absence of androgen, not the presence of estrogen, that is the responsible for female differentiation. This locking tide of gender identity almost takes on the tone of a new natural law theory in money. Quote, when the gender identity gate closed behind you, it locked tight. You knew 
in the very core of your consciousness that you were male or female. Nothing short of disaster could ever shake that conviction. End quote. Freudian natural law dictated that anatomy was destiny, and Eric Erickson, a more contemporary Freudian, polished this simplism into an inner and outer space analogy, where the inner sexual apparatus of the female and the outer sexual apparatus of the male were seen to be the prime determinants of feminine inner directed and masculine outer directed behavior. However, money has reversed the classical anatomy is destiny theory into a neo-natural law theory of social determinism. He continues, quote, once a sex distinction has worked or been pressured into the nuclear core of your gender schema, to dislodge it is to threaten you as an individual with destruction. The gate is as firmly locked there as it is on your chromosomes and gonads, end quote. Obviously, no one would deny that socialization is a powerful factor, but to make a deterministic, as money does, is to make it absolute and immutable. He and his associates have constructed a pseudo-metaphysics, which derives its natural value from societal processes instead of from classical nature. In effect, they have created a new theory of the social nature of sex role differences that is just as immutable as older biological natural law theories. Money's dismissal of the importance of social influence after the stage of early childhood demonstrates that he has not looked seriously at authors who write about socialization. As Berger and Luckman point out, quote, Everything that has been said so far on socialization implies the possibility that subjective reality can be transformed. To be in society already entails an ongoing process of modification of subjective reality. End quote. Money's response to this would probably be that while relative transformations are possible, the core of one's gender identity schema is locked tight. However, as Berger and Luckman state, quote, there are instances of transformation that appear total if compared with lesser modifications, end quote. They refer to such transformations as alterations and assert that they radically reassign reality accents. The radical reassignment of reality accents of core gender identity has become a lived reality in the past and present history of feminism. However, money does not allow this history or its consequences to affect his core gender identity theories and their immutability. If women had not been able to alter the nuclear core of our gender programming, we would not be doing many of the things that we are. One of the primary tenets of the women's movement has been the so-called gender identity differences that are not natural or immutable, and as such, they are amenable to change. However, as Time magazine reported, quote, despite his evidence of the importance of environment in molding sex roles, money holds out little hope to feminists that there can be significant breakdown of sex role stereotypes in the current generation of adults, end quote. What money does not see is that the hope of feminism is already being realized in feminists themselves who are living contradictions of everything that money is saying about the immutability of core gender identity. Obviously, the theory that core gender identity is locked tight by the age of 18 months has utmost relevance for causation theories of transsexualism. It enables money to suggest that transsexual gender identity is possibly fixed at a very early age. Flexible Stereotypes Although money's final position on gender identity appears to be ethically neutral, it has profound social and ethical consequences, especially with respect to the whole issue of transsexualism. In the last chapter of Sexual Signatures, Money and Tucker begin by stating that the 
stereotyped differences between the sexes will always remain. They censure both the right and the left for respectively wanting to keep the stereotypes rigidly circumscribed or wanting to abolish them altogether. Feminists might justifiably wonder which leftist movement has ever wanted to abolish sex role stereotypes altogether. Seemingly, they advocate the via media. Quote, Many of the pioneers maintain that the stereotype differences between the sexes should be done away with, and many non-pioneers fear that relaxing gender stereotypes will do away with all differences and homogenize the sexes. Both groups are tilting at windmills. As long as there is a human race, there almost certainly will be differences between the sexes in sexual behavior, work, and play. End quote. What they stand for is flexibility. Individuals must, quote, bring more flexibility into the cultural stereotypes so that those who are growing up today need not be handicapped by having obsolete sex distinctions driven into the core of their gender schemas by the pressures of stereotypes that are unnecessarily rigid, end quote. Nevertheless, the stereotypes themselves should remain. Abolishing them would violate money's canon that socialization is destiny. In sexual signatures, Money and Tucker assert, quote, the healthy society is one that tolerates experimentation with a variety of adaptive responses within its stereotypes, end quote. The major criticism I would make of this adaptive responses or flexibility position is that a flexible stereotype is a contradiction in terms. Webster's New Collegiate Dictionary defines stereotype as to repeat without variation. A stereotype that admits a variety of adaptive responses within it is no longer a stereotype. A fixed pattern admits no flexibility or else it is no longer fixed. Furthermore, it should be noted that on a historical level, it is within the nature of stereotypes to give the illusion of flexibility. Interestingly, Money and Tucker state, quote, People can no more be expected to decode behavior that has been locked into the core of their gender schemas than a Chinese woman whose feet were bound in childhood could be expected to walk naturally, end quote. It would seem that the authors do not realize that stereotypes do mutilate personal development, just as foot binding mutilated Chinese women's development. To advocate a flexibility within the range of stereotypes, yet not do away with the stereotypes completely, is similar to giving a woman whose feet have been bound in mutilated crutches or a chair to be carried in, yet not the ability to completely and freely move about. The language of flexibility is deceiving. On the one hand, it gives money's biologism and social determinism the appearance of openness and variability. But, in fact, he makes a hidden and rather subtle ontological assumption that social change cannot affect the core of gender identity and is definitely limited to undefined parameters of flexibility. However, the cannot changes to should not, the ontology changes to ethics. From the position that adult individuals cannot alter the nuclear core of their gender schemas, money moves to the stance that, quote, if society or your early environment drove that distinction into the core of your gender schema so that it has become an integral support for your gender identity. Society has no right to demand that you drive it out again, end quote. Would money assert that if society has driven racist attitudes into the core of one's identity, it has no right to expect that one should drive them out? Money's ethics thus boiled down to prescribing the continuation of sexist roles, modified in some undefined and arbitrarily flexible manner. In fact, the sexist nature of his ethical prescriptions becomes evident in his advice about child-rearing practices. Quote, The ideal is for a child to have parents who consistently reciprocate one another in their dealings with that child. Then a five-year-old daughter is able to go through the stage of rehearsing flirtatious coquetry with her father, while the mother appropriately gives reciprocal directives as to where the limits of rivalry lie, 
conversely for boys, end quote. This is an incredible piece of sexist advice, advocating some of the worst aspects of sexual stereotypes. Why should a five-year-old girl be encouraged to rehearse flirtatious coquetry with her father while her mother stands on the sidelines permitting such behavior within suitable limits of rivalry? Once more, little girls are taught to identify with men and men's ideals of them while at the same time learning to see other women as rivals for male affection. In conclusion, what does this advocacy of stereotyping, albeit flexible, mean for transsexuals? If people not only cannot but should not change their core gender identity, and if society has no right to the man that they do, then transsexualism becomes an adequate and morally right solution to so-called gender identity dissatisfaction and confusion. In this perspective, if one cannot adjust the mind to the body, it becomes perfectly reasonable to adjust the body to the mind. Since core gender identity is fixed by age two and money schema, then the body and not the psyche must be changed.